Okay, today we're going to start diving into statistics, and we're going to start by talking about the beginning of the statistical, statistical process, which would be conducting studies and using samples. So we're going to talk through a lot of vocab and kind of the, the big picture idea of what statistics is. So let's start right at the top. Statistics is the study of data collection, analysis, organization, interpretation, and presentation. So statistics is basically the study of data, how we collect data, how we use data, and what data can tell us, and everything that that encompasses. So statistics is a big, big field, a big word for a lot of different things that are all connected. Two big vocab terms we're going to use a lot are population and sample. The population is the entire group that you're interested in. So you are trying to uh, survey um, and you want to know the average height of a person on the planet. What's the average height for a human being, let's say. The population would be all human beings, right? Because you want to know what is the average height. So one way to do that would be to line up every single person, measure their heights, write them down, and divide by the number of people there are, right? Find the average, add them up, and divide by the number there are. Well, if you know anything about the planet, you know there's about 7 to 8 billion people there's no way you could measure 8 billion people. So finding out what the average height of a human being is, is impossible, literally impossible. By the time you got partway through, there'd be more people that you had missed and people would die while you're measuring. Like it's just not physically possible. So you would use a sample. A sample is a smaller group within the population that is analyzed and used to represent the entire population. So if you're trying to find the average height of human beings, what you're going to do is choose a much smaller group of human beings and find the average height of that group. And then, depending on how you came up with that sample, that smaller group, you can say what the average height is for all people because you will have a good idea that the average that you calculated on your small group is the average for the bigger group also. And it works with some surprising success as long as we follow certain steps. Right, so we've talked a little bit about why we can't survey the whole population. A lot of times the population we're interested in is just too big. The United States Department of Converse, Commerce does survey the entire population once every 10 years. It's called the census. Right, so if you survey the, an entire population, it is called a census. Uh, in the case of the U.S. Census, when they count every person in the country, it takes forever. We only do it at once every 10 years, and it usually takes most of the year, and they plan for it for multiple years. They do it every 10 years. The last one was in 2010, and it cost $13 billion. Those of you playing along at home are realizing that this is 2020, and that that means we're having another census, and it just started. Um, I've already responded to, for the census for myself. It's online this year, or it can be online, which will make a big difference, but it'll be interesting to see how much this one costs because so many things change in 10 years. Um, I would imagine that even with the internet bringing some of the costs down, it's still going to cost more than $13 billion uh, to get some basic information from every person. The things the census asks about are like your ethnicity, your age, how long you've lived where you live, do you own a house, do you rent a house, how many people live with you, how often do they live with you, do you have kids, how many kids, those kinds of things. It's just to get a brief demographic picture of our country. Uh, but because it takes so long and costs so much, we only do it every 10 years. Most of the time when a survey is being conducted, it's not being done by an entity as big as the U.S. government, and they're certainly not interested in spending $13 billion to figure it out. So we have to use much smaller samples. Okay, so we're going to look at these three examples real quick and figure out what the population would be and what the sample would be. Number one. A researcher was interested in the effectiveness of a learning program in preparing high school juniors nationwide for the ACT. So one school in each state was selected to participate in a test study. So in this case, the population is going to be every high school junior in the country, right? He's trying to measure the effectiveness of some learning program, some study plan, probably something they're charging for. And they want to say, this is our percent effectiveness, right? Because they're going to try and advertise. So the population is going to be high school juniors. There are a lot of high school juniors in the country. We have 300 at our school alone, and there's another school in town. Imagine how many there are in New York City or San Francisco. There are too many high school juniors to ask them how well they were prepared for the ACT. So the sample is going to be one school in each state and the juniors at that school. Right. We also have to assume that every student in the country took this learning program because we don't know what they're talking about, but we're going to assume everyone in the country has done it. Otherwise, you would rule out the people that haven't even seen the program. So the population is all juniors in the U.S. 
sample would be all the juniors at the schools that were selected, right? It's a much smaller group, but that group exists in the bigger group. Number two, a researcher is interested in the average number of hours of TV watched per week by children under the age of five. So a sample of 100 Montana children under the age of five is conducted using hospital birth records. So the sample is pretty easy in this one. It's going to, because it says right here, a sample of 100 Montana children under the age of five. So there's 100 kids in Montana who are under five and they were selected. That is the sample. The population is going to be all children Oh, I could go this way. Under five. It doesn't say in the U.S. It doesn't say in Montana. It says the average number of hours of TV watched per week by children under the age of five. So children under the age of five would be the population. If you're a child and you're under five, you're in the population that we're interested in, regardless of where you live. So we're talking, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of children that are under the age of five. Way too big to survey. So they chose the 100 from Montana. We're going to talk about in a minute that the method by which you choose your sample and how well that sample represents the population is crucial. In this case, those Montana children probably do not represent the population all that well because the life of a child under five in Montana is going to be pretty different than the life of a child in New York under five or the life of a child under five in Italy or the life of a child under five in Russia. Those are all very different. And so this is not a good sample, but it is a sample nonetheless. Last, Mr. Zanto is deciding whether the school should change our mascot, so he surveys some of the students. Right, so if he's surveying students, he's obviously interested in the opinion of the student body. So the student body is the population. He wants to know what do the students think. There are 1,400 students. That's too many to ask one by one. So he's using a sample, and that sample is some of the students, whatever that means. It's not very specific, right? But he talked to some, and that some is the sample. Why wouldn't he just survey, for example, the football team? Think of a reason. You're probably all thinking of different reasons, and that's fine, but I would imagine your reasons all rotate around this one word, or they're involved in this word somehow, and that word is bias. You may even have said the word bias, but do you know what it means? Could you define bias? Good news is I can. Bias is an error that results in a misrepresentation of a population. This occurs when one conclusion is favored over another, based on the sampling procedure. So if you ask a specific group of students that all have something in common, what they think about part of the school, you're going to get probably a similar response, right? Football players all have one thing in common. They play football. There are a lot of things that make somebody want to play football at their high school, but you end up with somewhat of like a like-minded group. Now, I'm not saying that all football players are the same by any means. That's not true of any team. But what I am saying is that they tend to have certain things in common, and those things might influence how they feel about the mascot one way or the other. Maybe they all really want to keep it. Maybe they all really want to change it. But chances are they tend to have the same opinion. Now, that would not represent the school all that well, right? So you have to find a sample in a better way. There are five methods for finding samples or conducting samples that allow for the sample to better represent the population. The first is what's called a simple random sample. In a simple random sample, every member of a population has an equal chance of being selected. So for example, student randomly selects 100 students using their student ID number. So this could be as basic as putting every student ID number on a sticky note and folding the sticky note and putting it in the hat and he draws out 100 names, or no, 100 student IDs. Or probably more likely, he would list all the student ID numbers in Microsoft Excel and then use a program to randomly select 100 of them. That's a simple random sample. A slight twist on that is what's called a systematic sample. And that's where you still organize uh, members, probably by student ID or maybe by alphabet, whatever. And you randomly select a starting place. So maybe you put all the students in Microsoft Excel in a list and you alphabetize it. Then you randomly select a number between 1 and 1,400, and you start there, and then you survey every fifth student after that. So you might start with, you know, somebody Thompson, and then you're going to start at Thompson, survey them, and go down five names, and survey them, and go down five, and survey them. And now five doesn't have to be the number. It could be 12. It could be 36. It doesn't matter. That number would probably also be random, but you just keep going in that interval until you get the 100 that you need. So they're very simple. They're just different ways. Or th these two are very similar, and they're both pretty simple. Um, they're just different twists on how you come up with your random sample. 
There's also a self-selected sample where members volunteer to be included. So for example, keeping in theme with our mascot, an email would be sent to every student through their school email, asking them to participate in this survey if they want to. Now, this might be great for some things, but it also might not work for others, right? So the method by which you find your sample has a lot to do with what you're trying to learn. Students who are really involved in the school might have a higher likelihood of checking their school email, for example, or students who have a strong opinion about the mascot are going to be more likely to respond than students who don't really care. So self-selected offers a lot of room for error depending on what you're asking about. A convenience sample is you ask members who are readily available or easy to reach. So Mr. Chauncey could stand in the hallway by the office and just survey students who walk by. Right now, again, is that purely random? In some sense, yes, because he's just standing by and those who walk past him get talked to. However, depending on what period it is, who's walking by the office, right? People going to PE or people going to see the nurse or going to band or going to health or going to weightlifting. You're not getting anybody who's going from math to history or art to science. None of those students are walking past the office. So you're already ruling out a bunch of students. So it's convenient because Mr. Johnson can just walk outside his office and stand there. But depending again on what you're trying to find out, you may not be getting a truly representative sample. Depending on the question, this might be totally fine. Um, and we'll get more into that later. And then last is what's called a stratified sample. The population is first divided into similar non-overlapping groups, and that's important. These groups have to be non-overlapping, meaning you can't be in more than one group. And then members are randomly selected within those groups. For example, using student ID numbers, Mrs. Kidder randomly selects 50 students from each grade level. So the non-overlapping groups would be the grade levels, right? You can't be a sophomore and a senior. You can't be a freshman and a junior. You are in one of those four groups or none of them, right? So um, if you're a student at Capitol High, you fit into one of these groups. So then from each group, she randomly selects 50. How she randomly selects 50 could be any of the other method, methods we've already talked about, but it would probably be... Um, just pulling names out of a hat or pulling student ID numbers out of a hat, something like that. So we're going to go through these study types and determine whether or not they are biased. So every fifth person at the Country Music Showcase is asked to name their favorite radio station. The sample type, if we're talking every fifth, that sounds like a systematic sample to me, right? We're using a system to select. You could also maybe call it a convenience sample because they're right there in front of you. Um, is it biased or unbiased? What do you think? I'm going to go with biased, right? If you're at the country music showcase, chances are your favorite radio station just might be a country music station. Now, it's not a guarantee, but that's certainly more likely to be country than it is to be hip hop or pop, right? Um, or you wouldn't be there. So that's definitely a biased question. Number two, the CEO of a large company divides his employees by gender and then randomly selects 20 from each to participate in a survey. So sample type is going to be stratified, right? You're divided into different groups first, and then equal numbers from each group are chosen. So that's stratified, put people into groups, and then pull equally from those groups. Is it biased or unbiased? And this one might be hard to answer without some more information. We don't know if the genders are even, right? Maybe there's only 20 men at this company and there's 460 women. If there's only 20 men, you're asking every single man their opinion, but not every woman. So that's probably not fair. Uh, could be biased depending on what you're interested in, what question you're interested in. Um, so it really, we would need more information about number two, I think, to determine if it's biased or unbiased. But it could be either one, depending on what you're asking and depending on what the demographics of that company look like. So it could be either way. This is a little bit of a summary page. Let me scroll, zoom out a little here. I can't. Um, showing the three types of studies we can do. There are surveys, observational studies, and experiments. Um, I'm going to give a few points here, and then these blue words are reminders for me uh, to tell quick little stories about my experiences with these. So in a survey, Data is collected from responses given by a sample regarding characteristics, behaviors, or opinions. So you ask the people about things. Um, 
for example, you can determine whether the student body is happy with the spring dance theme or, um, you know, if you want to change the mascot or not. That's a survey where you just ask somebody about their opinions. An observational study is when members of a sample are measured or observed without being directly affected by the study. So you're just watching to see what people do without actually doing anything to them. For example, a gaming company watches a group of teens play a selection of video games and notes which ones they play the most. So they're just trying to determine uh, you know, which games are more popular than others, but they're not doing anything to anybody, and they're not asking, they're watching to see, right? So in a survey, you could ask, which games are your favorite? In a study, you provide them and you see which ones they go to. And then in an experiment, which is the most hands-on, you divide the sample into two groups, the experimental group and a control group. And an, an experimental group undergoes some change. You do something to them. A control group, you leave alone just to compare the experimental group to, because you need to know what if we didn't do anything, what would happen? The effect, of the, the, the effect on the experimental group by that change is then compared to the control group to see what did the change do. For example, a teacher administers a paper and pencil test to an algebra class and a computer test to the other class. Then the teacher compares the scores and the completion times of the two classes to see, you know, maybe which test was better. So, my experience is, uh, when I was a college student, I was asked, by, I was a member of the student, go student government, I was a, a senator for the senior class, and I was asked by uh, the president of the college to determine, well, the, the student government was asked by the president to determine whether the student body wanted Carroll College to be tobacco-free or not. Uh, MSU and U of M had both recently decided to go tobacco free and so uh, Carol was trying to decide the same thing should we do that should we not there were a lot of other factors involved it wasn't just a student decision but the president wanted to know what did the students think so he asked the student government so then the student government asked me to lead the team that was going to do this so I got a list of every student's name at Carroll College in a huge excel sheet I mean there were 1500 names and then I used a random sample I randomly selected student names and I chose, I think, 150 of them. And then I emailed all 150 a link to a survey asking about whether or not they felt Carroll College should be tobacco free. And I got responses. In some sense, it was also self-selected because I did not force those people I emailed to respond to me. It wasn't truly self-selected because I didn't just put it out to the whole school student body. I selected a sample and chose, um, chose those students randomly to represent the whole population. So I did that, I ran emails, I respond, I reminded those who didn't respond over and over again, and eventually I got my, my results, and I was able to determine that the student body was 89% or something pretty high in favor of going tobacco-free. And then I was able to run some further analysis, which we won't get to uh, in this class, but you will if you take more statistics later on in high school. Um, I did what's called a confidence interval, and I was able to say that if I did this survey over and over and over again, randomly selecting different students every time, 95% of the time, the results would be between 80% wanting to go tobacco-free and 98% wanting to go tobacco-free. So that shows that pretty confidently, these results represent the entire student body. Um, I also did an observational study as a class project once. Uh, I was a junior senior and I used one of the underclassmen dorms just because the doors are all closest together and I went down the hall knocking on doors. I randomly selected the door numbers and then I just knocked to see if people were home. If they weren't home, I kept going down my list until I had, I think, 40, 40 of each. But my goal was to see if women's intuition was real. So I just, I did like 30 men's doors and 30 women's doors or something like that. And I had, I flipped a coin five times and I asked them to predict the outcome of each coin toss. And I wrote down, you know, which gender was more successful at predicting the coin tosses. And I found that, oh, what do you know? It's not a real thing. Women are now, are no more likely to predict coin toss than men were. That was an observational study because I watched them predict something, but I did not do anything to them to influence their choices, right? But it wasn't a survey because I didn't ask them about their feelings or beliefs. I watched them perform a task of some kind and just recorded the results. Okay, and then I also conducted an experiment as part of a different class project. Um, I was testing to see there's an expression that buttered toast always falls, or that toast always falls butter side down. And that's more of just a pessimistic saying because it's like, oh, if you drop your toast, the butter lands can land on the ground and you got to throw your toast away. Whereas if the butter lands side up, you could probably leave it because it's not quite so sticky, you didn't pick up as much dust, whatever. 
So I wanted to see if that was true. So I used, I think, butter, peanut butter, and jam, and then plain bread that I just uh, put an, an A on one side of. And I just literally like coin tossed, but with bread. I dropped the bread vertically to see if it landed on its butter side more often than not, or the jam side more often than not, or the peanut butter side more often than not. And turns out it does, but only barely. It's probably just because of the weight of the butter on one side. But that's an experiment because I, I separated the bread into different groups. I left one bread completely alone, and then I did the other things to the other groups to see what would happen. So that's an experiment. Observational study, I just watched people predict coin tosses, and in my survey, I just asked people how they felt about whether or not the school should be tobacco-free. There isn't anything that's better about a survey than an observational study than an experiment or vice versa. They just take more work and there's different applications for each. There's just three different options. Okay. Um, a census is a survey in which every member of the population is questioned. So we talked about the U.S. census. Well, the U.S. didn't name that. If you survey an entire population, it's called a census. So if Mr. Zanto asked every single student whether or not we should change the mascot if he called them into his office one by one and asked them that would no longer be um you know that he would no longer be using a sample he would be performing what's called a census and that's because he's asking every single member of the population what they think it's not an experiment it's not an observational study it's a survey but of the entire population so the reason we call it the u.s census is because we're asking questions of every single person in the country. So we're taking the entire population and asking them individually, making it a census. Okay, um, we're gonna go through some examples here and I want you to determine whether each situation is a survey, observational study, or experiment. Okay, so a company shows five different commercials to a group of students and records their reactions. Is that a survey, study, or experiment? be an observational study, right? Because we're showing the commercials and just watching to see what happens with students. Believe it or not, this actually is how this is done. That's how they determine what to name certain things. They have these focus groups and they just record reactions. I worked at the movie theater at Cinemark uh, for five years when I was going through high school and college. And we would have people who came in and all they would do is stand in the front of the theater with a clipboard and watch the audience watch the previews. And so they would just record the audience's reactions to the different movie trailers to see which movies people were most excited about. Same exact idea. Number two, scientists study the behavior of two groups of rats, sugar and no sugar, rats who are given sugar and rats who are not given sugar is what that means, to determine the sugar's effect on their ability to complete a maze. So they're taking a bunch of rats, dividing them in half, giving some of them sugar and giving the other group no sugar and asking them to complete a maze. What is that? study, survey, or experiment. Hopefully you said experiment, right? Because we're doing something to some of the rats to see if it makes a difference. Number three, the school board is interested in parents' thoughts on building new schools in the district. So a questionnaire is sent home in the newsletter. Is that a study, a survey, or an experiment? They're sending a questionnaire out in the newsletter, so they're just asking questions. That's a survey. And if they send it out in the newsletter, it might be close to a census. It depends on whether or not the newsletter automatically goes to every person or not. But if they're getting responses from every single parent, that would be a census. Now, I know that they're not going to get responses from every single parent. They'll probably get responses from like 10%, but it's a survey if you're just asking questions. Um, when you conduct a survey or experiment, just like in the sampling process, it's important that the process itself, the survey or the experiment, does not contain any bias. So bias in surveying will occur when questions are meet one of four criteria. If they are confusing, if they encourage members to answer a certain way, if they cause a strong reaction, or if they address more than one issue at a time. So before I move from the screen, pause this and write these four down because you're gonna be looking for these four keys in questions coming up in your homework tonight. So one more time, bias in surveying, if you're just asking questions, happens when questions have one of four or more of these um, qualities. If the question is confusing, it's a biased question. If the question encourages somebody to answer a certain way, that's a bias. If it, a question causes a strong reaction, that's a bias. And if the question addresses more than one issue, it's a bias. Bias in experiments occurs when members of the control and experimental group are not chosen randomly. So maybe you take your look, um, 
you're trying to figure out, you know, which which rats can do that maze more quickly. But rather than randomly select the rats, you have them all go through the maze first. You take the slowest rats and you give them sugar to see if they catch up. That is no longer a valid experiment because you chose the rats not randomly, right? You had a reason for choosing which rats you gave sugar to. So that would no longer be an unbiased experiment. Okay, so um, bias in surveying is not necessarily difficult to avoid if you're trying. However, many times a survey is biased on purpose. And the reason that the bias might be there is to get certain results. So probably the biggest time that this happens would be one of two areas, advertising and politics. Okay, so there's a political cartoon that you're seeing the top of, I'll scroll down to in a second, that's an excellent example of a biased survey that might be biased on purpose. So this is from, you know, obviously a few years ago, but do you think President Obama is doing a great job, a wonderful job, or an absolutely terrific job? Right, and you can see on his briefcase, it says he's from the liberal media polls. Um, what might be biased about this question, right? You only have three options and they're all the same thing. So when they publish the results of this survey, what are the results going to look like? Oh, it's going to look like Obama was doing a great job, right? And whether or not you think that's true doesn't even matter. The point is this question is horribly biased because it doesn't give this poor guy the chance to really give his opinion, right? You're telling, you're encouraging him to answer a certain way because all of the choices are the same thing. It could be the exact opposite. Do you think President Obama's doing a terrible job, a bad job, or a poor job, right? Those are all the same thing. It could go either way. Keep an eye out when you see surveys and survey questions or advertisements and think about was that a biased experiment or a biased uh, survey before you think about what the results are. So another common one is the paper towel trick on the blue liquid. You've all seen that before in commercials, right? Where they take the brand that the commercials for and some other brand and they both lay the paper towels down on the liquid and they pick it up and one rips or doesn't pick up all the liquid. But what if one of those had more layers than the other one? That would be a biased experiment, right? So things like that happen all the time. And it's done on purpose to try and convince you of something. Um, so we're gonna go through these three questions and see whether or not you think they're biased and then answer why. So number one, do you like animals? And would you ever consider having a dog or cat as a pet? So first of all, is that biased or unbiased? I'll give you a second to think. I think this question is definitely biased. Okay, so let's talk about why. Do you like animals and would you ever consider having a dog or cat? Let's go back to our reasons for bias here. Is the question confusing? No, not really. Does it encourage members to answer a certain way? No, not really. Does it cause a strong reaction? Eh, probably not. Does it address more than one issue? Yes. Do you like animals and would you ever consider having a dog or cat as a pet? Now, if I say no, that makes it sound like I don't like animals. But what if all I'm saying no to is I would never have a pet? I might love animals, but be deathly allergic to dogs and cats, right? So would I ever consider having a dog or a cat? No, absolutely not. It would be very dangerous for me. But I could still love animals. So we have, this would have to be two different questions. Another bias is could you like animals but maybe not like dogs or cats? Sure, maybe you like reptiles. Maybe you're a reptile lover, but so you're not gonna like dogs and cats. That doesn't mean you don't like animals, right? So that one's definitely biased. Number two, what type of music do you listen to? Biased or unbiased? As many of you are probably saying unbiased. I think there's an argument there. I think there is a small amount of potential bias in that maybe somebody doesn't listen to music, right? It might be fairly uncommon, but there are definitely people out there who just don't really listen to music all that often. I don't listen to music a lot. I mean, I do, so I wouldn't consider that biased if I was being asked, but there are people who just don't like listening to music. This question assumes that somebody listens to music. Not nearly as biased as the first one, but you know, it's biased. Uh, number three, to study the effects of a new training method, a dog trainer tries the old method on a group of terriers and tries the new method on an experimental group of retrievers. So he's using the terriers as a control group, using the tried and true method, and trying the new method with the retrievers. Is that biased or unbiased? So this, first of all, isn't a survey, right? This is an experiment. This is absolutely biased. Terriers and retrievers are not the same thing, right? Um, 
So you are choosing your groups based on a different attribute of the participants, not randomly. If you mixed the Terriers and Retrievers and randomly selected, that'd be a different story probably. But these are not the same thing at all. So to compare the results between the two probably has more to do with which breed of dog you're talking about rather than the training method. So that's important also. Um, I want you to take a second and write one biased and one unbiased survey question that could be asked to gauge interest in a new menu item. So normally I would walk around and ask people to share these so we could talk about them. Obviously we can't do that if you're watching this video, but I want you to still write down the two questions just to kind of get your head into asking these questions. Write a biased one and an unbiased one. Take a minute and a half, pause this video, and then come back when you have those two written. Okay, so unbiased survey question about interest in a new menu item at a restaurant. So you might give the menu and then one question you might ask to try and avoid bias could be, would you be interested in trying our new menu item, the, you know, filet of, filet of cod? That's fairly unbiased. Just, hey, are you interested in this? That's all it is. A biased version of that question might be, would you like to try our deliciously hand-breaded, golden, crispy, fresh-caught, wild Atlantic cod served on a bed of hot, crispy French fries? Doesn't that sound way more enticing than the first way I asked it? You're probably more interested in it then. You could bias it the other way. Um, hey, you're not interested in trying that greasy piece of old fish, are you? Right. So you could definitely encourage responses one way or the other, depending on how you ask that question. This video is getting long enough as it is, so I'm going to cut it off, and you guys are on to the homework. Good luck.